23 minutes to the hour of 7 o'clock. Some program changes uh, this morning here on CNC3. It's the morning brew. We do have the Minister of National Security with us this morning speaking about his representation to the people of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, but also as Minister and some of the things that are happening and how he's addressed them as the Minister of National Security. Uh, good morning to you, Minister Stuart Young. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, CNC3. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And thank you for joining us this morning. Not at all. It's my pleasure. L let us thank start you for having me. You're welcome. Let us start with this idea that you are the minister of everything. Where, where, where did that come from? Well, Natalie, I mean, that arose, I think, initially in my term as a government minister. And being asked, I mean, I am a servant of the people and then also... A uh, uh, servant of the the government and being asked to hold a number of portfolios temporarily, and I think it is just by the mere fact of being knowledgeable on most things going on in government, and having the ability to put on whatever hat I'm required to do and and to manage whatever area I'm put to manage. I think the opposition first came up with it as a derogatory term, but once again, I never saw it as a derogatory term. I think. It was just a description of me in, in one of the many attempts to try and discredit me. When you actually research Minister of Everything, it, politically, it is actually seen as an accolade because it is someone who can hold whatever portfolio they call upon and whatever job they call upon to, which is how I've been my whole life. You know, when the term came about, I think a lot of people just found that it was funny and thinking that, you know, there is this relationship between you and the Prime Minister, and that is why, you know, you're the minister of all the portfolios, and these are large portfolios. How are you able to maneuver that, to be a member of parliament to the people of St. Anne's, Port of Spain, and to also carry all of these portfolios? Weren't you stretched too thin? Well, I have been very, very fortunate throughout um, the vast majority of my life, and including this sojourn into politics. One, I had the complete support of the prime minister and my colleagues at cabinet. And then also I had a very, very supportive team on the ground in Port of Spain, North St. Dan's West as the member of parliament. So yes, sometimes you, you would find that you may have some, I had some struggle of balancing, but I think by and large, one of the things I'd promised myself in 2014 and promised the people, I have a saying and I hold true to it, I don't make promises. There are only two things I promised my constituents and the people of Trinidad and Tobago back in 2014. One, to my constituents, it wouldn't be the only time they would see me, so I continued working throughout the five-year period. I really enjoy being on the ground more than cooped up in an office, so I continued to work consistently throughout the, the, the five-year period, so that allowed me the ability to keep in touch with the people. And then two, the only thing that is in my control is to do my best in whatever I'm asked to do, to give up my best and give my full ability. So I figured once I stuck to those two principles, I'd, I'd get through, and um, so said, so done. With the changes made to the boundaries by the Election and Boundaries Commission, you are now responsible uh, for a wider catchment area, and what encompasses St. Anne's uh, North, Port of Spain North, St. Anne's Port West. Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West. Right. Yes. Also includes parts of Laventil. So right now, as it stands, you sit in the constituency that has two of the major gangs in this country, Rasta City and Muslims. And uh, several weeks ago, we saw the uprising. We saw how people were affected. As not only the Minister of National Security, but the Member of Parliament for this area, what have you done to alleviate or to quell these kind of instances? Okay, well, first of all, let me start off, Natalie, that I always had catchment areas of the lower part of Laventil, a, a wide area in East Port of Spain, in my constituency. So what I had is now the additions of a couple polling divisions on the Port of Spain south side and then on the Laventil west side. And I welcome that. So I've actually walked those polling divisions since they became part of Port of Spain, North St. Dan's West, the whole Barcelona Street area, Barcelona Street community area. It was an interesting walk. When I first um, walked it, I guess also holding the portfolio of Minister of National Security, 
And yeah, I don't bury my head in the sand. Unfortunately, in Trinidad and Tobago, like most countries, I mean, I don't think there's a country in the world that can keep claim they're not affected by crime and some element of criminality. We have that in Trinidad and Tobago. It is not something that has ever intimidated me or not something that ever um, frightens me in any way whatsoever. And what I do is just send a message out on the ground that, you know, I am a law-abiding citizen. I am here to do what is right in accordance with the law and that I will do that. So in terms of how do we quell what happened a few weeks ago, fortunately, we had received some intelligence beforehand. Fortunately, on that day, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service supported ably by the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and this is where my national security hat now for a second, were able to do what needed to be done on that day and not allow the, the, the protests to become violent protests and persons you know, to, to, to lose businesses and these types of things. And then immediately, it is to get word on the ground and try and get an understanding of, of what goes on, um, whether people are frustrated. We have been, just come out of a difficult period with a stay-at-home, stay-at-home orders, and that did affect people. I mean, one of the things I was reflecting this morning when I woke up, as the MP going through that difficult period where I'm more vulnerable in society, and I have a lot of challenge areas in my constituency with people who don't have and people who are vulnerable you know what is it that we did at my constituency office and i did as the mp with the help of others to try and alleviate that and um you know it was really and we're still continuing to do it trying but to get hampers the persons and this type of thing. minister mm -hmm. if you had the intelligence before why did we even see things get to that point on that fateful day when i say the intelligence before it was not long before right so what you began to hear you would have seen if you throw your mind back the evening before at the Mova Junction, you'd have seen persons start to step over the line of what is acceptable from a, a legal protest point of view. So we're prepared. I mean, the point is that naturally we did. It was very contained as persons acted up in one area, those were shut down and we were literally looking at it on the CCTV command center. And you're seeing, you know, groups moving around running from the law enforcement and stuff to different areas, and it was contained. I mean, very fortunately, it was contained. It didn't spread. We then put in things in place for overnight, etc. It was not a good day for Trinidad and Tobago, but since the incident happened, mm -hmm. Since the incident happened, have you walked the grounds in those areas? Have you spoken to Absolutely. these people who were involved? Absolutely. And what has Absolutely. the feedback been? Well, people, honestly, when I've walked the ground in those areas thereafter, I mean, up to... This week, I, I was back up on the eSport of Spain side. People have not raised it with me, at least, the incidents and this type of thing, but I do know. I do know the difficulties people are facing. It's not something that came up overnight. And it is how can we work with persons? How can we work to alleviate some of their concerns? How can I work? I mean, I've told them in this term coming, when I'm returned as the MP for Port of Spain, North St. Dan's, where a major focus for me is going to be on the youth. So I've been trying to engage the youth more and more to understand what is their perspective, what are the things we can do. And I also have a mantra in the constituency. It's not about entitlements, handouts, and this type of thing. I'm willing to work with any community that is prepared to meet me somewhere along the way. You don't have to meet me halfway, because I understand the difficulties, but come out, meet me somewhere. And that has worked quite successfully in a number of the communities in the constituency. And the reality is that for the Port of Spain division is that the murder toll normally is a problem. And I'm trying to figure how you're able, as a member of parliament for Port of Spain, North of St. Anne's West, and also as the Minister of National Security, to accept what has been happening. Don't you feel that as a minister that you have failed in this portfolio, considering that the numbers for murder, the statistics have just been going one way each year, and it's up? All right. I mean, no, I don't think that way. Murder, homicide statistics are very, very disturbing and one measurement. The truth is, if you look at these statistics, and in particular for the Port of Spain division, fortunately, I mean, I'm not saying there's necessarily a direct correlation, but I'd like to think there is some. Fortunately for me as the Minister of National Security, Port of Spain division has actually gone down. It's one of the divisions that we've seen a downward trend on. Um, there was a spike late last year that the Commissioner of Police and myself talked about. 
But right now, the homicide toll is actually a lot lower. And that's, that's something I don't get into. I don't get into that description. Because as far as I'm concerned, what we have to continue striving for, and what I continue to strive for as a minister, is to try and drive our various units, our various divisions, the police services or intelligence services, the prison services or defense force, even our fire services, to make Trinidad and Tobago a safer and more secure place. I think people generally accept the right thinking and civic minded citizens of Trinidad that we have been in some difficult times and there were things done in the past that have led to led to this type of crime and criminality. I and, and that's a fact. It didn't happen overnight. These are not fruits that just grew up overnight and, and are now being picked. And we have a, a process and we've been tackling it, and you are beginning to see the results of that. And we will just keep at it. Minister, we are going to take a break, but when I come back, I want to speak some more about what's happening in your constituency, your plans Absolutely. for the people of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, but also your portfolio as Minister of National Security. Welcome back to the program. It is eight minutes to the hour of a seven o'clock. We do have on Zoom with us this morning the Minister of National Security and also the Member of Parliament for Port of Spain North of St. Anne's West, uh, Stuart Young. And we're going to be looking some more at the constituency representation. There is an election coming up. August 10th is the date. And we want to know, should you choose him to represent you again? Minister, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you very much, everyone, Trinidad and Tobago. You are on yes, record. Natalie. You are on record saying that you know the gangs. If you know the gangs, there's anti-gang legislation. There's, well, I, I don't think you all got through with the bail amendment bill, but you have so many pieces of legislation that can help with the crime rate. Why are we still seeing gangs? Gangs are on television celebrating that they're coming together to fight. I don't know who. They're uniting. Why haven't we seen a breakup? Why haven't we seen, you know, the anti-gang legislation being effective? We were told when it was being passed that this is going to help. This is going to make a difference. I don't know that we've seen that. Actually, Natalie, we, we are in national security. We are seeing quite a lot of the use of anti-gang legislation. Understand their number of, it's a process. So first of all, you gather intelligence, you then convert that intelligence to evidence. The evidence has to pass a certain threshold and you lay charges and, and move to prosecution. There have been a number of charges laid under the anti-gang legislation. As I keep reminding our law enforcement, there are also other powers that they have under the anti-gang legislation and they have been using. So the truth is the population has not been fully apprised of what has been going on under the anti-gang legislation, but they do know that there have been a number of charges, a number of gang persons that we call gang leaders, and I can call them that under the legislation, have also been charged for that. But as you are aware, the population is aware, the, the criminal justice system takes some time. The wheels of justice turn, but they turn slowly. And that is taking place. I mean, the anti-gang legislation, let no one be fooled is being fully utilized and being utilized quite well by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And there have been quite a number of charges laid, so they've crossed the threshold. And then also, this is not unique to Trinidad and Tobago. All over the world with criminal, criminal activity and criminal gangs, organized criminality, you have persons who, they know how to conduct their business. They're like businessmen. So the heads will not get their hands dirty at certain levels and there will be the smaller persons, and then they will be the ones charged. But rest assured, Trinidad and Tobago National Security, via the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or Intelligence Services, with the support of the Defense Force and others, are pursuing gangs and criminal activity. You talk about legislation. Just to make this quick point, Natalie, seeing, seeing that you're Jamaican, and I just want to draw the quick, quick point. It is a struggle when you're going after gangs and criminality that have been allowed for a long time. Let us not forget the birth and the explosion, the mushrooming of gang activity and funding to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars by the Live Sport Program. But in Jamaica, they came out with legislation, special legislation that allows them to sh shut down conflict zones, special conflict zones, where you basically stop constitutional rights and you have states of emergencies and declared positions. They did that a few years ago. People at the th time thought this would solve gang activity. It hasn't. I mean, it's something I resisted bringing to Trinidad and Tobago because I don't believe it is something that can work. And unfortunately, even in Jamaica, 
they're having that struggle. So it is something in, in national security all over the world when you're taking on criminality. Unfortunately, legislation is not going to be the, the simple fix to it. But we will, we will continue the fight, that's for sure. You know, Minister, while I hear you and, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that as the Minister of National Security, you think of this in a positive way, but the reality is that what you see and what the evidence is, they don't add up. It doesn't match up because the evidence is that even though you're seeing that the anti-gang legislation is working, is that just a few weeks ago when we had the uprising in East, East Port of Spain, we saw people saying, coming together, putting out statements that they are literally owning to the fact that they are gang members. The headlines were gangs uniting. So it seems okay, as if there is a curse of converting information to evidence in this country. And, and I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's very, very easy for persons in society to say, OK, Stuart Young is a member of a gang. But we need to convert that to evidence. So the same people in the community who will say, look, I've seen Stuart engaging in gang activity. When we now in law enforcement say, okay, well, would you be prepared to provide us with the evidence or with a statement to support that, any supporting? The answer is 9.9 is .9 out of 10 times no. So there are those difficulties. So we're using other, other techniques to gather that information to convert to evidence. Obviously, I don't want to go into that to alert anyone as to what it is we're doing. Natalie, I am by no means saying that there's not the existence of crime and criminality, and that is not an issue or problem in Trinidad. It is something we're very aware of. We are tackling hard. One thing I can say without fear of contradiction, there is no gang member, there is no gang leader that can say that they met with the Minister of National Security for the five years and cut any deal or any, any approach was made or anything like that. That is one thing I'm very, very clear on, that I will not encourage crime and criminality. And whilst I sit in this seat, which unfortunately my hands are tied because you're counting on the services to do the work, I will give it my best shot and I, I will do all that I can to represent Trinidad and Tobago and to try and make us a safer and more secure place. And I think persons being objective, they will have to agree that that is what is happening. What should, why should the people of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, choose you again to represent them? I'm the right choice. What makes you the right choice? <laughs> I was only using the cash race. Well, Natalie, I've, again, I've worked hard. I've done the best I can. We've had limited um, financial situation over the last five years. But I really have given it my best shot. And I think people know that I'm very responsive when, when people bring their concerns to me. And there are concerns, the water issues, the road issues. We've managed, I've managed after begging, begging and pleading with my colleagues for five years to get two new community centers in the constituency. We're building a new one where the old one existed in Jerningham Avenue. And we're getting a brand spanking new one in Cascade, which for decades they've been asking for. These are small steps in the right direction. I think people recognize everything can't be solved overnight, but I've really been working with a lot of the communities, especially um, a lot of the more challenged communities in the constituency to try and bring some relief and, and then listen to them. I think they're also, from what I've been getting from them and gathering from them, a lot of feedback. They're, they're pleased that once again, their member of parliament is a frontline person in the parliament one of the persons who very often contributes in Parliament, and I am doing the best that I can. Minister, would you say that the people of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, that their lives have improved tremendously, or even at all, over the last five years that you have been uh, their representative? Just for the, let's just look at the last five years between 2015 well, and Well, it could only be five years. Utilities, been there for five years. opportunities, jobs, safety, have their lives improved? Have their lives improved tremendously? I think objectively, tremendously takes it up a very high level. I, I don't think their lives have improved tremendously. Have their lives remained fairly s standard status quo and, and nothing absolutely disruptive has happened? The answer is yes. I've been clamoring, I've been asking for more to be done, but I'm also mindful as I sit around the table where resources are being spread. I'm, I'm mindful and I have a, a saying, eh, Natalie, and I tell this to constituents all the time, if we have only $100 to spread and that $100 
should, in my view, go to the more vulnerable in society. So those who have should accept that the $100 is going to be spread more amongst those who don't have. And, and, and that is what has gone on for the last five years. So we have a number of things that I'm being promised by my colleagues to happen, and hopefully it will happen in the next five years. Let us look a little bit at your portfolio as a Minister of National Security. I, it, since I have been in this country, I don't know that I've seen what I would term a successful Minister of National Security. And as I said, one of the things that people use all the time to gauge how successful a minister is, is the murder rate. And in the last five years, as I said, it's only trend one way. And I don't know that there's a cap anyway, even though my hand had to stop. But <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you think is responsible for this kind of death toll that we see in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, Natalie, there's a number of factors. I mean, first of all, you have that we have to accept that culturally things have changed just before the outbreak of COVID, the COVID pandemic, the global COVID pandemic. One of the things we're planning in national security is to bring an expert who has studied, he's from St. Kitts and Nevis, who has studied the link between mental health and wellness and the trending of violence. So in other words, people are no longer dealing well with their frustration and why is it that their, their immediate instinctive reaction is the violence so there's that level so you accept that by and large there's a lot more violence in society not only in the gangs and criminality but by and large and you're seeing it all over the world i mean i look at the international news you're seeing it as well then the the spread between the persons feeling frustrated that they don't have that too is an issue then for too long, unfortunately, the things that should have been done at some of our ports and our borders weren't done. And we had an influx. I mean, it's a fact. We had an influx of illegal arms and ammunition. So right now, as I constantly tell persons, years ago, I remember growing up, you would hear of a criminal once in a while held with a revolver, with a few rounds of ammunition. And there was always this um, evidence that they could not get hold of limitless amounts of ammunition. Now, unfortunately, because of things done or not done, more, more so, there's a widespread availability of illegal arms and ammunition. So it's very easily available. Every time you pick up criminals or we have raids, you're getting sophisticated firearms, you're getting the auto automatic firearms, the semi-automatic handguns with limitless, it seems, amounts of ammunition. So that but is Minister, an area that we've been tackling. You have the responsibility, you have the overall re responsibility as a Minister of National Security to treat with these things. So if there are firearms in the country, if it's still coming through, if the borders are porous, who are you going to blame except you? I, I am not blaming anyone. All right, what I'm saying is you ask me how it has arrived there, and I'm trying to describe how it has arrived there. We are tackling it. I wish, Natalie, I had all of the power to actually deal with it. For example, a very, very big element of port security is customs, customs and excise. They have powers that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service don't have. So a lot of these sophisticated firearms that we're seeing, they're not coming from South America. The evidence and intelligence suggests they're coming from North America through legal ports of entry. That is a, a gap, a hole we've been trying to plug. And what I am proposing to cabinet, and so far they've accepted, is let us change the law or allow me the opportunity to have a multi-agency approach that we can go into bonded areas, go into where these containers are coming in, meaning the police force, along with the support of the defense force and our intelligence officers, along with customs and do what needs to be done. Right now, we can't get in there. Customs are saying, this is our jurisdiction, you can't come here. And that's a real difficulty. And we are doing things. The, the, I wish that the Cape class vessels were here already. That adds to our border patrol, border security. When the country had money, why didn't we fix and maintain our interceptors? Those are important for border security. But we are using all of the resources. I can't get into the details, but I can tell you, under my tenure, we are using resources that were not being before Minister, on our border security. We, yes. we, we are aware of the fact that under the last regime there were things that were changed, things that this government would not agree with. I think every time we have changes in administrations, we'll always end up with these things. But you have been there for five years. 
What have you done to ensure that the borders aren't porous? To Correct. ensure that customs, which has all this authority, is doing what it is supposed to do to, to keep those guns out, to ensure that the v Venezuelans aren't coming in through illegal ports of entry. Tell me, tell the population of Trinidad and Tobago what you have done to remedy these situations. All right. I am part of an administration that has been in power for the last five years. So I'll take that as a collective. What have I done? Yes. I've only been the Minister of National Security since August 2018. So I just put that there on the record. Yes. What we have done is we've used the resources. Certainly what has been happening is for the first time, I'm told by those who are sitting in the chairs now at the police, the Defense Force Intelligence, for the first time in a long time, under my tenure, we're all sitting at the same table looking at and singing from the same hymn sheet. That in itself is a massive achievement, that there's no more siloing of intelligence. I demanded that from the time I got into office. We're sharing intelligence. I've set up a national intelligence fusion center where all intelligence feeds up into and then they will then push it out to the various bodies that need it. Unfortunately, we have, we pick up both ends of the stick. We're beautiful twin islands, but once you're on island, you have a maritime border that's 360 degrees, that is impossible to lock down every square inch of your border. What I did is we've improved our coastal radar system, but even with the coastal radar system, you still need to react. So if you see something taking place on a certain part of the coast, you still need to get your resources there in time and this type of thing. So we are utilizing all of the resources. Has it solved everything? The answer is no. But every time you see that the Coast Guard has intercepted vessels, that's a success. You know, people are saying, oh, look what is happening. But it is a success because we prevented that entry and what we've been doing recently is we've been turning them around and deporting them within the space of a week or two, housing them under this COVID in a special quarantine facility that has been set up and, and then dealing with that. There is a lot more to be done, Natalie. There's no doubt about that. Back yesterday, I was listing how for the next five years in national security, we'll be doing things. What is some of the technology we need to acquire? What are some of the areas we need to focus on? And a big area is the border security and the increasing in border security. But anyone, anyone who tells the country that they can close the borders and they will not have porous borders, immediately look at them as we see in Trinidad and they will go at Koki Ai, because that is impossible to do. So I look and I smile at persons now bandying that about and their full page ad saying they can do it. I know what it is they did to dismantle our border security. And I'm not gonna go into that because I can't change the past, you can't change the past. I can deal with the present and what we're going to do in the future. And a lot more resources are being put in that area. The two, o the two OPVs, the Cape Glass vessels, I'm asking for new interceptors, more interceptors. The radar system, unfortunately, the full upgrade of it has been delayed over COVID for the last six months. The new CCTV camera system that has, the cabinet has approved to be deployed nationally. These are some of the areas I'm prepared to mention in the public domain that are gonna have a big, big change hopefully in the national security and making us more secure. Share with us right now what resources we have <coughs> to protect the borders. Okay, without giving away the, the national security secrets, I mean, what you're looking at is we have limited air resources. So we have some fixed wing aircraft that we use. We also have some drone technology that we use. We have a coastal radar system, which is an excellent system that under my tenure, I gave, I got cabinet approval to upgrade with even better technology. And then you have your marine assets, which we know we don't have enough of, right? You have your larger vessels, you have your interceptors. I've also, we've also been using the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, along with the Defense Force and some special units to help us on the on-land border. But it is, it is massive. I mean, Natalie, I took the media out a few months ago on one of the Coast Guard vessels for them to see how short a distance seven miles is. Trinidad is seven miles off the coast of Venezuela at the closest point, and how quickly a fast vessel can cover seven miles at, all right? It's a matter of minutes, and how difficult it is. When the media stood on the bow of one of our Coast Guard vessels, 100 feet, 100 meters away, depending on the sea conditions, you may not see a vessel, depending on how small the vessel is and these types of things. Those are the assets I'm prepared to talk about we are acquiring better technology, but it is impossible. I mean, I look at the United States, I look at the United Kingdom, they have all the money in the world compared to us a small island. And they too 
<clears throat> have difficulty with their borders and their maritime borders. You know, Minister, while I hear you, the reality is that South America on a whole has seen tremendous rise in COVID-19 cases. And there is stock on the ground right here in Trinidad and Tobago. People believe that the Venezuelans who keep running here because of how they're treated here compared to other uh, uh, places, keep running here and we're seeing our numbers peak and people at this point they're saying it might well be local and community spread so i wanted to know if in the last couple of weeks if anything different has been done to man the borders if there has been any extra effort to keep those venezuelans out the illegal ones all right first of all actually this this phenomenon hasn't taken place in the last couple of weeks all right and i really want to caution the country at this stage let's not go down the road of xenophobia I saw us come very close where we went into the Venezuelan registration system a year ago, where we had that migrant registration, where we took a humanitarian decision. Let's register the Venezuelans on the ground here. This was in April, May of last year, 2019, and give them the opportunity. We say we're going to give you legal permission to be here. 16,523, utilize that. What you're seeing right now people are starting to have an element of panic and we just need to control it. I mean, up to last night, I was speaking to the chief medical officer, we're going to be meeting today. We are looking at there's contact tracing taking place. We always said people have to be cautious about this COVID, right? People started to let their guards down. We have been repatriating thousands of persons back into Trinidad and Tobago and making sure everyone is in quarantine. But even in that situation, I've seen how this virus acts, how it is different. You have people who come in, we test them, they're negative. Just before they're about to leave, they test positive and these types of things. It shows that there's no fixed pattern of this. We have been using, and I can assure the population, we have been utilizing all of the assets we have in national security, especially in the Coast Guard, to protect our borders. There is not a single asset more that we can use at this time. I, I smile when I see people take pictures, for example, of down at Stovall's, the Coast Guard base, and they say, look, all the vessels are, are docked. The vessels have to come in to change crew, they have to come in to get supplies, they have to come in to fuel, and they have to come in to go out. You're no longer seeing all there. They're staggered because we're operating at maximum capacity. Again, I made a call, tell us, because this thing didn't come up overnight. The population have a responsibility as well, provide the information. We will then action the information as best as we can. There are elements as well, and I smile because I've seen it being suggested even at high levels, for example, in the opposition, that there are elements of people who have been profiting from human trafficking. And that is something for us to be concerned about. I keep telling the media as well as law enforcement, when we do raids, don't show the girls who are the victims here show the customers that you hold, right, of some of these places. Name and shame them. That is what we need to do to change the conversation. I told the Coast Guard this weekend, these vessels that we're intercepting, don't focus on the Venezuelans, focus on the Trinidadian, in the Trinidadian nationals who are driving the boats and the vessels who are part of it. The police, I've told the police, please charge them. You have the laws, trafficking in, in persons law, immigration laws, you have the public health regulations, charge the Trinidadians. I've even gone a step further. I've told them, look at seizing their vessels under the proceeds of crime. Until we start stepping out of the box, using the legislation we have to the fullest and sending a message that there are consequences to this criminality of importation of illegal immigrants. How, how is it gonna change? So those are some of the things we're doing now. Opposition members, benefiting from human trafficking well i'm sure the minister is prepared to defend that allegation right after this break it's the morning brew stay with us welcome back to the morning brew i'm nasli lagore if you're just joining us early in the program we spoke with nafisa mohammed explaining to us why she resigned from the people's national movement and i asked her why now she said why not now and right now, we have been speaking with the Minister of National Security and the Member of Parliament for Port of Spain North, the St. Anne's West, Stuart Young. And right before we went to that break, he told us that members of the opposition are profiting 
from human trafficking. Minister, is, it, is, there an, is there an obsession with the opposition? We're always hearing these allegations of what the opposition is involved in, but somehow those allegations don't ever seem to turn to evidence where people are convicted, people are charged for what you are proposing they're doing. Why is uh, that? First of, all, I, first of all, there are suggestions and allegations. I think everybody saw it, especially around nomination day, exactly that 24 hour period before nomination day i saw things start to surface with allegations about the opposition having to change certain persons and not take them up for nomination because of allegations of exactly that being involved in human trafficking that is what i was referring to i agree with you very often there are and as a minister and i'm, I'm saying this aside to that last conversation we just had you receive as Minister of National Security reports, you receive intelligence reports. I think we now understand how intelligence has to be converted to evidence. Evidence then has to be cross a certain threshold for charges to be made. Actually, I never say anything, and I say this without fear of contradiction. I have never stated anything in public office, and especially in the portfolio of Minister of National Security, that I don't have things to back it up on that were provided to me by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or Intelligence Services. So I put that on the record very, very clearly. But again, and yes, the wheels of if, justice take too long. If you have things to back it up, why is it that those things aren't turning into evidence? That, so that's that the a good question. Population, the population can say, okay, the People's National Movement on the platform is accusing the opposition United National Congress of these things, and we can see action happening. Where is the disconnect? Agreed, agreed completely. So I get as the Minister of National Security an intelligence report in writing, in black and white, that a member of parliament is meeting at the Hyatt with persons who are persons of interest in the criminal world, some of whom have criminal charges. And he went to the Hyatt to pay a bar bill for them. That is a fact. So that arrives to me as the Minister of National Security. What am I supposed to do with it? Obviously, it concerns me. It concerns me as a citizen. Why would a sitting member of parliament leave the parliament when we were down at the waterfront on a Friday afternoon when there's a disruption taking place in the Hyatt with criminals, persons who have criminal records and have engaged in criminal activity to go and pay their bar bill? So they could create all of the things and say, well, I was in charge and I am not this, I am... I receive that in black and white. So of course it concerns me. And then I ask the police service, I say, okay, well, you all have provided this. I assume you all are going to investigate it and action it. And that's where it stops. I am not going to be telling the police, go and investigate short young, you know, you've told me, no, you've provided me with the information. I expect and I know that our police service is a responsible police service and they will now go the next step to do what needs to be done. Okay, Minister, one of the issues that has been plaguing the population, everybody's been talking about it, are TNT nationals who are stuck outside of Trinidad and Tobago due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, you've been tasked with the responsibility of returning the nationals to their rightful place to Trinidad and Tobago. But there are questions as to how you choose who gets exemption, when they get exemption, and why you're giving them exemption. I am asking you, how do you determine if you have 200 people to return from country X, how do you determine who of those 200 people are going to be exempt and given that exemption to return to Trinidad and Tobago? And actually, I am sitting here and I can actually show you if you're seeing. This is the, the latest folder, not of all of the jurisdictions, of the thousands of names that I'm currently looking at. There is no secret to the criteria, right? So I'm seeing this suggestion that you had to go to court to get the criteria, etc. From day one, there's been a very principled position. Let us start with this. And thank you for the opportunity to, to, to state it. And it has already been put out in the public domain because there was a, an, a request and the permanent secretary has put out what is the criteria as far as we can go because I understand at the end of the day is people's personal information. These sheets of paper, these hundreds of sheets of paper, of spreadsheet, contain persons' personal information, why it is that they say they should be prioritized in coming home. Let's start. First of all, 
Trinidad as a government, we took a decision to protect all of our population here in Trinidad and close our borders. The second thing is when we're granting exemptions, you're always balancing the numbers. So how many, because we've taken a further decision that every national coming back has to go into quarantine. State quarantine initially, and now we have a second category of state supervised quarantine where you can pay in certain institutions. Those facilities, to rush through it as quickly as I can, have to be manned by medical personnel who have to monitor. And then, so, so there's that balancing exercise limited. Trinidad is very fortunate that we have a parallel healthcare system to deal with COVID that has not affected the running of our daily healthcare system. So persons still on a daily basis can go into the hospitals, the health centers and get attention because we built out a separate COVID parallel system. You can't let those numbers go out of flux and pull persons to the deterioration of your normal healthcare system. So you're dealing with a limited number of ability and capacity to quarantine people. That is our decision. Everyone coming back will be quarantined. So you're dealing with a limited number of spaces there. You're then also balancing that with, as we are looking at right now, if cases suddenly spike and increase, and they're in the parallel healthcare system, you don't want it to be overrun. So whatever numbers we always have in quarantine, we're balancing with a worst case that suppose now there's an outbreak, a local outbreak, and amongst those who have come back, we must be able to contain them in our parallel healthcare system. So that's the first point understand it's a limited number. Then what we got to is you look, we were looking at jurisdictions and bringing back persons from jurisdictions at points in time in a managed process. All nationals will get back, but it has to be managed. That is what has helped us a lot so far. Again, I was looking last night at, at Jamaica and Prime Minister Holland is standing up in the parliament and saying, listen, persons that we allow to come back and go home and self-quarantine are not doing it. And he's referring to we seen your posts on social media. So we know that we have to quarantine people. Then when you start to look at the list now, Natalie, I broke it up. Persons who are elderly, because we have different categories of people. So there may be people who went away for a week or two weeks in March and got stuck outside. You would have only gone for two weeks in your mind. Now you're stuck outside for months. That is different to what we're seeing now. Persons who chose to make their life in foreign countries and are domiciled and resident in foreign countries. And maybe for one reason or another, they may have lost their jobs. They may be difficulties there, or they just think, I don't want to be here anymore, I want to go home to Trinidad, they are now applying. So how do you prioritize that? So we're looking at the elderly, the sick, then we look at persons who have young children. We have quite a few people who went abroad and ended up having their babies abroad. So a lot of newborn babies and, and mothers who are, who are suffering and want to come home. And then you look at those with young children, then you have another category of the students. Now, the students would have only started coming up in the latter part as they finish their courses, etc. So do these students take priority over those who were there for longer? So consistently, what we look at is the date of initial application for exemption. And then you look at the extenuating circumstances as well of, of persons. So it is a constant balancing. It is not an easy thing. It is certainly not a task I wish on anybody. But those are the criteria that we're looking at and that we're applying. And then, of course, you have limited space, as I say. So even when you're having a plane repatriate, so I can say now, right now I'm looking at the first set of repatriation flights from the United States. So we're going to use a CAL plane in the next week to take students and other persons up to the United States who want to go, and we're going to bring back our first plane load of persons. Yesterday, I was working out with the Ministry of Health, a specified designated facility to put those persons who returned from the U.S. there and then you continue that. And I'll tell you, I expect us to have positive cases in there because the United States right now is ground zero. That is the biggest explosion of population of positive cases. So these are the criteria that are being used. So you look at the age of the person, how long the person has been out there, the capacity when of the healthcare system, when they put in their, application for, 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 put in their applications. Correct. But let me if, ask if you this. If they have young children. If you understand. have... If you have 50 students in Jamaica and all 50 of them applied for exemption, how do you determine of that 50 students from that one jurisdiction, who comes home first? That actually, if, if we were turning to Jamaica again, because remember we did a repatriation of our UE students at Jamaica, and I'll tell you, some chose not to come home because they had practicals going on, they had exams, they wanted to stay on for internship, etc and now they, 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 they would like to come home. But of course, the priority has now turned, well, you have other jurisdictions. If you add 50, Natalie, 
a plane could hold that, that 50 and bring them back. So we'd have granted exemptions to all. So like students in Cuba, for example, we granted exemptions to all. Not everyone came back on a flight. With Grenada the other day, I granted exemptions to 76 persons to come back from Grenada. When the plane arrived, it only arrived with 54. So you, you go through those types of things. The difficulty really is, like for example, the United States, where you have over 1,100 applications currently, and an application could contain a family of five, or could contain a group of 10. So, so it's exponentially multiplied. How, when you only have a plane that can hold 120 persons to bring them back, that, that is where the difficulty becomes, and that is what we're trying to push through. We open the phone lines at 6248721-627-8658. Those are the numbers to call. We do have the Minister of National Security, the Member of Parliament for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, uh, on with us this morning, speaking about all things national security, as well as his representation to the people of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West. Give us a call, 624-8721. You might have a, a, a question for the Minister. You might, might want to share something with him that he can help you with. Of course, he's saying that there is some kind of order and to how they <laughs> decide to take people back home. Caller, good morning to you. Morning, Natalie. Yes. Morning, Mr. Minister. Morning, good morning. Uh, um, Natalie, Mr. Minister, one of the things that you are not mentioning, and I think that should be mentioned, is that we don't have accommodation here to hospitalize people with this disease. Now, we might have quarantine spaces, which doesn't require hospitalization where the medical personnel are there. We have more of that than the two hospitals that treat with this disease. And that is Action. one of the, of the factors that we should be at least letting the public know that it's not that everybody who comes back, if there's a possibility that they can have the disease or might end up with the disease, where do we put them? Thank Hold you. on. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely correct, sir. And I thought I had explained that. That is the parallel healthcare system. So you're right, we have a parallel healthcare system that we've built out. The majority is at Hoover and Quora for if persons get sick. So right now, we have a number of positive cases who are at those facilities being treated for COVID-19, the positive cases. So we do have that, but the, the space is limited. And as the Ministry of Health was reminding me yesterday, as I looked to increase the repatriation load, so I'll tell you all, we're right now waiting for 80 people to come back from the UK in addition to the 100 plus that I'm going to bring back from the United States as our first repatriation. And they're saying, just remember, Minister, that we have limited, um, we have limited in the healthcare, the parallel healthcare facilities, we have limited ventilators, and we always have to measure that, and we always must think in those case, if there is a bad outbreak, and we're seeing it happen that way. Last night, I was reading what is going on in Europe, in Europe right now, in Germany, which is one of the places that's handled it the best, all of a sudden, they've had a spike yesterday, over 3,500 new cases, and they're starting to worry. Spain, that opened back up and said, look, we're going to allow persons to come for tourism. They're now starting to claw back and worry. You're seeing it in countries. We must take notice of this. And, and the caller is right. It is limited. The, the number we can bring back at any given point in time is limited by our limited parallel health, healthcare system that has to treat the positive COVID cases especially now where in the last couple of days, few days, about five days, we've had local cases pop up that right now the contact tracing is taking place. We have just about five minutes left, Minister, so I'm going to ask you to just get straight to the answers and to the callers as well. Just five minutes, so just get to the questions. Caller, morning to you. Good morning, Natalie. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Welcome. Good morning, Minister. Thank you. Yes, I heard morning, everything you said, but what I want to find out is I mean, we were going so well all the time with the strategic closures of the airports and the, you know, the strategic re-entry of, of nationals back into the country. But now with this increase in the numbers, what can you say to allay the fears of the nation, the population, you know, who, who would what? be concerned about the increase in all these COVID cases? We could be walking around and it seems like every day it's two and three, four more cases. So Thank you what can much, you say Carla. to allay, allay the fears of the population? Thank you. Minister? Let us go back to the basic principles and you're not seeing persons doing it. We have asked persons to wear masks. We don't want to wear, make the wearing of masks mandatory, but when I am outside, I'm not seeing everyone wearing masks. That's, that in itself will go a long way. 
to us reducing the spread of COVID. Wear masks, continue to wash your hands, social distancing. You're seeing people gathering. People, the bar owners and other persons were, were arguing with the government up to a few weeks ago. But the type of behavior you saw taking place when people are recreating and the gathering of persons, the congregating of persons as persons become more loose with the drinking of alcohol and, 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 and the droplets flying from your mouth, etc. These are all factors. You're seeing it. Trinidad is not unique. When you look at other jurisdictions that have had to claw back and, and roll back, and we're not there yet, you see it is because of that type of behavior. So Trinidad and Tobago adhere to the health protocols. Please wear your mask, wash your hands, do your social distancing, only go out if you need to go out, and just get back into that mode and frame of mind. There's absolutely no reason to panic. We have a call on the line. Morning to you. Morning, morning, Natalie. Morning, Minister. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I want to take this opportunity to say um, thank you to the Minister, and I'm not curry favoring in any way, win, lose, or draw, agree or disagree. Clearly, you all are working very, very hard, right, to the, um, the, the COVID team and to the, the Prime Minister come down. Clearly, you all are working very hard. I want to ask... You, sir. Um, for those persons who are getting exemptions, apart from the hotels, do um, would the persons be expected to pay for the government institutions? And if not, no. or if they have to pay, would they be able to choose what institution they go to? Thank you, Cola. Okay, the, the quick answer is no. So right now, the state quarantine facilities, we're not charging persons for it. Now, to try and increase the numbers of persons that we can bring in via exemptions, we've introduced state-supervised quarantine, which are hotels that persons can pay for. We ask them whether they're willing to pay, and there are a small number of persons who are willing to pay. So even with that, I've seen only a very small percentage say that they would pay for those facilities where we supervise them whilst they're in quarantine. But no, Does it state give them, quarantine sorry, facilities, Minister. you don't have to pay. Does it give them the right to choose when they're paying Sorry, for and the answer is no. The answer is no, because you're constantly balancing. So, for example, one of those hotel facilities we've been using for a long while, we've had a, a number of positive cases in, in the past few days of persons coming back in. We have, we have to air out that facility. So we are constantly, my, we meaning the government, the Ministry of National Security and the Minister, Ministry of Health, balancing and sending persons to the facilities that are available. So no, persons by and large, don't have a, a choice as to where they go. Cola, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Yes. I'd like good to morning. use this opportunity to congratulate and thank Mr. Young for the sterling contribution he's been making to constituency and country during the last five years. As a lawyer, he will have been making a lot of sacrifices too. Uh, he has stood out too in different ways by distinguishing himself and how he has used his legal skills apart from being a minister, but in certain important negotiations and so. Uh, I think we have a bright future with Sir John in charge, and I look forward to seeing him in Parliament again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you Cola. very much, sir. Good morning to you, Cola. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Mr. Minister. How are you this morning? Good morning, sir. Not Good. too bad. Mr. Minister, you. I have two um, quick things. One, yes. I've been on the water in the US. And uh, that is over the weekend. And I have seen, I have counted at least 17 Venezuelan boats coming in with people. Into, in, and even Alcon, you just drive into Alcon, you will see a whole set of them on boats just doing nothing. And my second question, since I'm the registration of Venezuelans, I would like to know how much more Venezuelans is registered to vote for this coming election. Thank you. Thank you, Cola. <laughs> For second question, first, not a single Venezuelan has been registered to vote. As, as we made very, very clear when we did the Venezuelan registration process, no rights would attribute to the Venezuelans. No, their time spent here at the behest of the government does not go in the immigration law towards them having any right of residency, citizenship, anything like that. So please, and the EDC also came out very early o'clock and said that, that there's no registration taking place there. So there are no Venezuelans being registered to vote by this government and administration. The, f the first point that you raise, my understanding, and I've asked for an investigation, these Venezuelan fishing vessels or fishing vessels of local fishermen who use Venezuelan crews are uh, always bringing in fish, which are then packaged and sent away for, for sale by Trinidad and Tobago. They are not supposed to be disembarking the vessels. So when I heard about this, and understand I 
there's, it's impossible to know what's going on in every square inch of Trinidad as an individual. Immediately, I asked that investigations be done, and I've also sent a warning that if the Trinidadian businessmen are breaching the regulations, so those who are engaging these fishing vessels and allowing them to disembark, they will be charged, and their, their licenses can be revoked as well. I've sent out written notice to Port Health and to Immigration asking them to ensure that the regulations are adhered to. Let's take a final call. Caller, good morning to you. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Minister, I saw yes, on, on a place where we, we, we're trying to send them back, and some people are saying, don't send them back because of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights. That's my first point. So you, you're like you're between a rock and a hard place because they're coming in so they could do what they want. You quarantine them, and then you must not send them back. That's my first point. My second point is, do you have on land a combination of like police, camera, and the, 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 all the, the, where people could enter, that people will see what is taking place, that they will realize if 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 the police are taking bribe or whatever, whoever doing something, so a camera to see exactly what is taking place around the borders, so that somebody can be held for what is for what is happening, because this cannot continue. Thank well, you thank you very much. Ma'am, I agree with you completely. I made it very, very clear as a representative of the government over a year ago, even when I was meeting with the, the UN high representatives from the UNHCR, that anyone, any migrant who's in Trinidad that breaches our laws, I have no problem in deporting them, right? Anyone. So I've also made it very clear that Venezuelans who are registered here, if they breach our laws, I will deport them, and I am doing it. So we have had a number of deportations, hundreds of persons deported back to Venezuela in the last few weeks. Tell the population that at the end of the day, it's all well for those who are human rights advocates, as I once was, to say what they have. But my job is to keep the population of Trinidad and Tobago safe, and that's the government's job, and that's what we're doing. So persons who come here illegally and we detain them, when they're quarantined to keep the population safe, those that we detain, we have been deporting them and sending them back. Minister, your With final. respect to the cameras and the police and this type of thing, I mean, a great idea, not rocket science, and I don't want to say more about that at this stage because you don't, you don't want to get into the specifics and the particulars of what technology we're using. Your final comments to your constituents and also to the population at large? Thank you very much, Natalie. It's been a pleasure um, for participating here this morning. I'd like to thank the people of Trinidad and Tobago sincerely for the opportunity to have served I've gained a lot of invaluable lifelong experiences. It's been a real pleasure to serve the people of Trinidad and Tobago and my constituency of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, who I will be serving for the next five years from the 11th of August. And I will give them my commitment to continue doing the best that I can for the next five years to take us to 2025. Trinidad and Tobago, we are one of the best countries in the world. And I, I say that without fear of contradiction. Let us not spoil all of the good work we've been doing with COVID. Let us be responsible. Let us listen to what our health personnel are advising us and adhere to the health protocols. Natalie, continue doing a great job. I mean, you've transitioned very, very well and, and, and seamlessly into your new role. And it's a pleasure sharing with you as, as we've done in the past. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And I'd like to tell everyone in Trinidad and Tobago, it's your civic right to go out and vote. And on Monday, the 10th of August, less than two weeks away, go out and vote. Go and do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. And I leave you with this one point. Decide who it is when you wake up on the 11th of August, you want to be in charge of Trinidad and Tobago to continue leading you in a very difficult global pandemic that is COVID-19. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you very much, the Minister of National Security and the Member of Parliament for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, speaking with us. This is the morning, Bruce. Stay with us.